join me here tonight. So the silver word of prayer is as we begin tonight. And Father, we come before you and thank you, Father, for the day that you've already given to us and just uh, for the opportunity to be in your house again tonight. We pray, dear Father, that you just uh, speak to our hearts, dear Father, once again. And, and uh, we thank you, dear Father, for uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ and just for what each one of means to, to each other. And we're thankful for that. And ultimately, we know that that's all because of you as well. And so we're thankful, dear Father, for the church family that we have. And I pray, dear Father, you've helped help even in this uh, coming year, dear Father, to knit our hearts closer together as we look to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. We'll take a few favorites this evening. <laughs> Got the piano player back? Yay! <laughs> That's why he was whistling. Yeah, yeah. That's why he was whistling. Thank you. 
63. 63, all right. What a day that will be. Page 63. Even Brian's. message that we had started, I think, three weeks ago. <laughs> Finally getting around to finishing it. We may have to start over. And the title of the message was, Should We Be Seeking or Should We Be Serving? And if, I don't know if you're, I'm not even going to ask if you recall it, probably don't. I had to go over the whole message again myself. Um, and recapping the first part, we did get through the first part. Um, and the first part was to seek good, God is good. And, we, and the main points there was uh, one should certainly seek after the Lord. He's the source of our sustenance and strength. He's the source of our wisdom and understanding. Um, and secondly, one would hope to find God in church. We talked about that as another way of finding God is is attending church and, and the importance of it. Also, yet God is found in obedience and not just in church attendance. We actually hit on that even this morning a little bit in our, in our message. And then the, la uh, and then the last point we, where we finished up before we ran out of time was then God can be found anywhere, anytime. And we put the little caveat to that, but that's not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Um, and so that's where we ended. So this evening, what we're going to be looking into, and, and actually it's, a, it, it's, it's actually not that lengthy, to be quite honest, but some various thoughts for us to look at this evening. And it's to serve God is better. Um, and, and of course, the seeking is important, to seek after God. But I would say that also serving Him uh, is also better. In, in, our, in the essence, and we'll get into what the reasoning for that and the thought behind it tonight. Um, first of all, uh, we would say finding God. In finding God, we must serve Him. 
And I think, and, and, and the premise then this evening is this, before, if, if you weren't here, or even if you were, to, to, to hear that as far as seeking God is good, and of course we should be seeking after God, we would, and we went into all the reasons why we should be doing that. But in the essence of serving is, and it really hits on, a, Alan's actually been hitting on the same thought too, is that in, in the essence that once we are saved, once we do know him, then what are we doing with it? What are we doing with what we know to do? Um, and, and we can be seeking and we can be in, uh, entertaining and soaking in all of this knowledge about God. But then what are we doing with it? That's what the premise is then again this evening. Whereas as believers then, serving him is far better than just seeking after him. So again, it's not to discredit seeking God. Uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. But once we do know God, it's doing something about it and, and for him with what we know. So that's the premise. So again, to serve God is better. So number one, we would say finding God, in finding God and coming to know Jesus Christ, uh, we must then serve him. Uh, that sh should be a, a gimme as far as for a believer. Um, but not always the case, is it? Um, it's like the old saying, and you know, most of the time it's probably said with a smirk, but people <coughs> make the comment that 10% of the people do 90% of the work in any given church. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't believe that's true here, though. No, that's not, and, and, and I'm thankful for that. Mm -hmm. um, and people are very much willing to jump in. And I think uh, I think if you if you have a church where they have a, a, a heart for one another and a heart for the Lord, ultimately, I believe there's not going to be a problem whenever with people jumping in to be able to help to serve. They're going to want to do that. Um, I think whenever a church is all about themselves or or, um, or is not headed in the right direction and different other things that can enter in, I think there's going to be uh, a lack of participation. There's going to be a lack of individuals uh, longing to even want to participate and wanting to help or all those different things. Uh, so, once again, uh, finding God, we must be willing to serve Him. For this reason, we're, number one, we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. Uh, if we would, we, we don't have the screen up for this evening, so we'll have to, uh, you'll have to turn into, into these passages. But Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll give you a moment. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse, or in four, in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. And here, notice, and again, this is under the thought that for this reason we were cleansed by Jesus' blood. As far as finding God, we must serve him. And again, here in Hebrews 9, and verse 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? So notice that verse again. He says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So there's a point then as far as once we come to know Jesus Christ, once he's cleansed our hearts from our sins, then there's, then there's a point to what he's calling us to do. And what is that? It's to serve him. Uh, and uh, also we would say that also it's not just in the aspect of that uh, for the reason we're cleansed by Christ's blood, but also for this reason we're receiving an unshakable kingdom. That's what God has given to us in this as well. Just a couple pages probably in your Bibles. Look over in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Just a few pages over. He says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... That's a blessing in itself, isn't it? There's a, every every uh, kingdom, if you will, or country, um, 
tower on the face of this earth is at one point collapsed. Um, think about that. Every one of them. Um, I believe it's only by God's mercy and His grace that we have it. Up mm -hmm. to this point, anyway. Um, but every, every civilization has at least collapsed as far as their political system and whatnot. It's either been taken over or it's just... I mean, you think about Rome. How vast the Roman Empire was. And it collapsed. Mm -hmm. And most of them were from the inside out. And, and ultimately it was because they were not looking to God. They were godless societies. And so here it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, it says, Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's, it. That's interesting, isn't it? In that understanding this reality that God's kingdom is never going to be shaken. There's nothing that's going to remove him off of his throne, uh, even as much as Satan wants to. Uh, it's not going to happen. We already, can, we already know the end of the story, don't we? You see that at the end of Revelation. What's going to happen to Satan? His demise is already written. Um, and so here we see that in the end of this verse again, by which we may serve God accept acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So once again, as servants of his, this is how that we should be looking to him. This is how we should be serving him, is with reverence towards him and, and godly fear. I think that's something that's missing uh, today is the aspect of God, a godly fear of who God truly is. Um, he's not just our buddy. He's not the man upstairs. Uh, he's, he's God. He's the creator of the universe. And he's our savior. So once again, we would say that finding God, then we must serve him. Uh, also, we, he will continue to serve, will continue to serve God into eternity. Uh, let's look at two different passages into this. Over in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, and beginning in verse 15, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 15, and here it says, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And here, he's, this is exactly what we're going to be doing. Uh, and, and, you, and the blessing of it is, it's not going to be a drudgery for us to be able to do this. Um, just like the, um, Dorothy, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. What was the song that you heard us on this morning? Um, yeah, look for me at Jesus' feet, right? And to serve him, you know, that's that's not going to be a drudgery for us. That's going to be something that we're going to, it's going to be a joy to do, is to worship our Savior. That's what we're, we were created for, by the way. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And then notice, uh, one of my favorite verses along this thought is, and it just it'll be over, a few pages over, Revelation chapter 22. Look over here in Revelation 22. And notice in verse 3. So we see how that we're going to be serving him day and night. And the blessing in that too is <laughs> we're not going to be tired anymore. <laughs> That's going to be a blessing, right? So, you know, there's that aspect. But here in Revelation 22, and notice in verse 3. And, and, and pay attention to the verse. I love this one. It says, and there shall be no more curse... But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. If you read down through that whole text there in, in, uh, in the few verses before him and following, and you just read it right through, it, it, there is no special emphasis given here on, on the end of verse, verse 3. But notice it's, it's just more of a gimme. He says, and his servants shall serve him. Why? It, because we're his servants. It's just it's going to be ex an expected thing. But notice, and I also believe that the reason that there's not a whole lot of emphasis there is because it's going to be a delight. It's going to be what we're there for. 
So therefore, you don't have to make this big oration about, you know, because he did this, 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 and this, then we're going to serve him. It doesn't have to be explained because we know what he's brought us out of. We know uh, the sin that he's, uh, that he's saved us out of. And at this point, when we are standing before him, we're going to be able to grasp that in its entirety. And I really don't believe that we can really grasp that truly while we're here on this earth in its entirety as far as what Christ has truly done for us. Uh, I know that I think I know Wanda and uh, how many have been over to Israel, taking trips to Israel? I know Wanda has, right? And I, she may be the only one. Um, Right. And, you know, and people have mentioned, you know, how that whenever they're, they're there and they, they, they are standing in the areas where the Lord has walked and those types of things. And he just can, you know, become just overcome that, that the Lord was there and then seeing Golgotha and, and all of these mm -hmm. places. But I can't imagine when we stand before Jesus' feet what that's going to be like. And that's why we come back to this verse, and his servants shall serve him. It's going to be just the standard thing. Why? Because that's what we're going to be doing, and that's what we're going to delight in, and that's going to be our heart's delight, and that we don't want to do anything else. That's the blessing. And so, yeah, and that brings us to that point, is that, and that's in eternity, but here's the, here's the reality is this, that why aren't we doing it while we're here? Why, why don't we have that same joy? Why don't we have that same um, thrill of understanding of what Christ has truly done for us and in so doing, serve him? And I think, again, it's because we don't truly spend the time contemplating and thinking on the things of the Lord as much as we should. Um, and I would say this, too, as a little caveat to that, is he doesn't want us to serve him out of a heart of duty. Because the, the danger in it is, is, and I've heard a lot of preachers say, make this comment, and I'm sure they mean well. And they make the comment, they say, well, look at all that the Lord has done for us. How can we but not serve him? Now, I'll be honest, in years gone by, I, I've actually made that comment from time to time. But he doesn't want us to live out of a heart of duty. Why? Because there's what are we going to do to offer to him that's going to come up to par even? There's nothing. So what we do for him should come out of a heart of delight, not out of duty. And even that's going to really pale in comparison to what he's given to us. But you know what the blessing is? That's what he wants. He wants our hearts. We talked about that this morning. He wants us to be able to serve him. He's going to give us the heart to want to do so. That's also a blessing. And But as, as we continue to follow after him, he's going to continue to give us uh, this longing and desire. And the more that, that we do it, the more that he'll give to us. And I truly believe that's his grace and his mercy in our lives on a daily basis. So here, as we think about this as finding God, we must serve him and here in, in, in verse 3 again, there in his servant shall serve him. And this is, again, just something that is into the future, absolutely. But this should be something that we're doing now. It shouldn't be a shock and awe when we stand before God that, oh, 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 you, oh, you want me to serve you. <laughs> it should have been something where we've been used to doing all of our lives is serving our God. And then we come down to the thought... Under this, the main point is, is again, to serve God is better. First of all, finding God, we must serve him, and that's what we've been talking about here. But then also we have the opportunity to serve him in our, in our local congregation, in our church, and, and actually in our community and in our world. Um, as we offer the sacrifices of praise, and in particular, we're going to kind of hit on the opportunities that we have, even in our church, to serve the Lord. As we have the opportunity of sacrifice through prayer and song, uh, we, we are spiritual priests, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, 
Uh, let's look over there for just a moment. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. Here the Lord looks at us as spiritual priests ordained to offer spiritual sacrifices. <clears throat> Notice here in verse 5, he says, You also as living stones are, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So here we can offer sacrifices of praise. Uh, we would also say even through song. In Hebrews 13 and verse 15, I'll just read this. Well, actually, if you want to look over there, we're going to look at a couple different texts of Hebrews. I'll give you a moment. Hebrews 13 and verse 15. Talking about this aspect of giving him sacrifice through song and also through our lips. He says in Hebrews 13, verse 15, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And we mention that from time to time, but, you know, how often do we thank the Lord for what he is doing in our lives? Um, you know, we, and we're, we're quick to bring prayer requests, and as we mention so often, there's nothing wrong with prayer requests. Um, he wants to hear those too. But if, if at times, if we could imagine and put ourselves in at least one vein, as far as in God's position, if all he heard was request after request after request from his people, and he never heard a word of praise for what he is doing, for who he is, um, that would become very discouraging, wouldn't it? Um, it's, it almost hints at where the people of Israel were from time to time, where they forgot the blessings of God. And we've mentioned that from time to time, too, where a lot of times that's where uh, really the, uh, the falling away of God's people in the Old Testament started, was with an unthankful heart. And that turned into... Uh, into turning to other idols and turning to other gods because they thought that God had given up on them just because things weren't playing out how they thought they should play out. And they turned their back on them. And then in the end, from, from time to time, we see how they went into bondage and captivity because God allowed other nations to take them over. Why? Sometimes for the, for the uh, sole reason that they had just forgot God. And it all started with a heart of unthankfulness. So we need to be careful, even in our own lives. You say, well, that couldn't happen to us. We're, you know, we're in him. Well, it's not necessarily that we're going to be cast off as his people. The nation of Israel was never totally cast off as his people. But he allowed them to go into bondage and captivity and other things happened to them until they realized, hey, we need God. And then they came back to him. And then they grew story and that's exactly where we can be if we're not careful in our own in our own lives uh, here in Hebrews chapter 10 just a couple pages back we would say we also in the opportunities to serve in our church through song and prayer we would say also we edify one another through our assembly and praise. Here in Hebrews chapter 10, we talked about this verse a little earlier. And it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. If every church would understand that concept alone, and not just stirring people up, <laughs> but stirring up unto love and good works. Sorry? What verse? 10, what? 10 uh, 24. I'm sorry. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And it says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. So nothing was new, even, you know, even back here. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching.
approaching. And you can imagine back at this point, and we don't know exactly who the writer of Hebrews was, but even at this point, whenever Hebrews was written, if they could write this and make the comment there at the end, and so much as you see the day approaching, how much more can we say that? Uh, We're far, I mean, I, I'm not one of those that are going to write a book and say who, uh, who, what, where, and why, and when, but because we don't know. It's only in the Lord's mind and heart whenever he's going to come back. But it's far sooner than it was back here. True. And so with that said, notice what he's saying in the whole context. He says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Continually helping to encourage one another when we have the opportunity um, to be around one another. Are we stirring each other up into love and good works? Towards, ultimately, we could say towards Christ's likeness. Or are we just stirring up one another? And then he goes on and says, Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. That exhorting is to encourage one another. Truly encouraging one another. Um, and and, I would, and that's, that's a blessing to me of the body of Christ. Is, is that fact, even if it, that was the only fact alone, was that encouraging one another. That's a blessing in itself, but it's only one of many, thankfully, right? Um, but this exhorting one another, and as so much as you see the day approaching, and, and we see that all around us. Um, if, you, if, you, if you've had your head buried in the sand, um, this world is no friend of God. Sure. And that's continually getting worse and worse, and we see that. Um, can't say enough about it. And so here, we need to edify one another through our assembly, and then also as we make intercession for others through prayer, and not discounting prayer, of course, and we need to hit on that. Uh, look over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you would. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Once again, the main thought here in serving God is better as we have opportunity to serve in the church. How can we do that? Through as we make intercession for others through prayer. First Timothy 2, notice in verses 1 um, down through verse 3. Here it says, Therefore I exert, exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. And I, I'm going to make I'll make this comment, and I'm, I'm not going to say any more about it. But um, we really, really need to be praying for our governor right now. If you're not paying attention, it's not going to go well in the next few months. That's all I'm going to say. But he's about to make some decisions that are going to be catastrophic for this state. Mm -hmm. And we need to be praying for him. Um, he, he needs God. That's what he needs. And notice here in this, in this context of these verses what it's saying. It says, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. But then he goes on and says, for kings and all who are in authority, why? Why? What's the premise of doing all of this? That we may lead quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. He's about to make some laws come into effect. They're going to uh, counter what this verse is saying. Where it's not going to lead to a quiet and peaceable life. Sure. And it's not going to lead to a uh, life in, in all godliness and reverence. Why? Because he's not reverencing God. Right. So we need to be praying for him. We right. need to be praying for those who are, who are 
uh, he's surrounded there with him uh, around himself as well because they're really all in the same boat of the need of, of God um, and that's just one aspect of prayer but I think that we need to start there we need to start by praying for those who are in leadership over us in every aspect of whoever those are um, and then also we would say underneath this as well as far as do prayer if the prayer of the right man avails much more so the prayers of many righteous look over in James if you would James chapter 5 and verse 16 here again the thought is if the prayer of one righteous man avails much more so the prayers of many righteous James 5 and verse 16 says confess your trespasses to one another your sins and pray for one another that you may be healed then he says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and he's only talking about one that's that's the context that's the number that's listed but can you imagine if God's people collectively Amen. look to the Lord and not to just and it's not to just get them out of their circumstances because sometimes God doesn't uh, take us out of all of our circumstances that's a fact but on the flip side here as he as he's saying he says confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed and the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and in a lot of times we, we we are taking this out of context in the sense of well you know well, whatever I pray for a righteous prayer is going to avail much in the context he's talking about confessing our sins and who's he talking to here he's talking to believers we need to be we're, uh, righteous in, in God's eyes in every aspect of our lives we need to be very careful in that. We need to be confessing our sins. We need to be looking to the Lord each day, making sure that we hold a close accounts before the Lord. He knows our hearts anyway. So confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. What? Not necessarily that you're going to be just physically well. Should we be doing that? Sure. That, that's a great prayer request. But what's the greater prayer request? We might be well spiritually. That there's not sin in our hearts that's going to cause us uh, grief between us and the Lord. One day we're all going to pass away from the, in this body, one way or another. But it's what where our hearts are with the Lord is going to be what's going to be most important at that moment. So here, as he's saying, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Not necessarily spirit, physically here, but spiritually. That's what he's talking about, which is far greater. I would, I would, uh, I would rather be spiritually healed by my Savior than than uh, than uh, than to be physically healed from every other disease known to man. And then he ends up by saying, "The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much." And I truly believe that means in the heart of the life of another. If you know that your brother or your sister is in sin. Praying for them, encouraging them to understand the reality of where they are before a holy God, where their sin is, is and, and what their sin is doing to a holy God, and it's causing the lack of, of, uh, of kinship there because of their sin. It's driving a wedge. So we need to be doing this, and, and prayer is is effectual and then the last thought is is as we partake and we think about even as we partake of the Lord's Supper as a way of serving and you say well how is that serving let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 1 Corinthians chapter 11 
here, you say, well, how, does, how am I able to serve in the Lord's Supper? I would say this, as we all participate in the Lord's Supper and the opportunities where we have to be able to do so, um, it's in an essence where each one of us are proclaiming the Lord's death and what he's done for each one of us. It's actually in the essence the serving is in the acknowledgement and the participation of realizing what the Lord has done for each one of us in our lives on the cross. And notice here in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Notice what it says after this. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it's actually a form of service that each one of us has opportunity to be able to participate in. And realizing that this blood, that this body that was broken, that this blood that was shed was given for you and for me. And it's a prime opportunity for each one of us to be able to, to thank him. Actually, in every aspect of service, whatever it is that we do for the Lord, uh, the ladies come in and, and uh, clean, uh, whatever the case may be, whatever we do in this church or outside of this church for the Lord, it's all for him. It's actually, in essence, a, a, a symbol of, of, of understanding that the least that we can do is serve him, no matter what we're doing. It doesn't always have to be something necessarily big spiritual thing, but it's in our service to him. Think about Linda playing the piano, and what a blessing that is. And uh, I, I know coming from, uh, uh, I know Dad always talks about how he's jealous when he comes up here because they don't even have a piano player. And uh, I know at one time we had two, and I think he was really jealous then. But uh, uh, but the thought of it is is that uh, you know there, there's things that we sometimes take for granted, don't we? But they're all in service for the Lord. Whatever it is, um, you know, the Bible says, whatever it is that, that your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Why? What's the purpose of that? In service to him. And whatever it is, you know, I appreciate John, John uh, doing the video. Um, there's people that thank me all the time for being able to have the video. It's not me, it's John. John's doing it. Uh, but it's a blessing because if they're not able to be here, uh, I'll tell you one of the uh, greatest examples of that was, uh, was Janice. Um, she was always really thankful for that and whenever she couldn't be here and I know uh, Cookie, Cookie was here this morning and uh, posts all the time just how that she's thankful to be able to, to watch the services and those types of things and you know sometimes we think about these things and it's not you know maybe the most glamorous things but hey they're all needful aren't they because they all have their place and, and in, in the end it's all in service to the Lord that's what it's for so as we wrap this up tonight uh, with, let you look at one more passage and in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 if you're still there in 1 Corinthians it, it should be um, well you know what yeah let me, let me read that one 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and beginning verse 16 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. And it says, and then we look at verse 16 and 17, it says, The cup of blessing which we bless, 
Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. And that's a, that's a sincere blessing as if you look at those verses. Notice that again. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? He's saying that the aspects or the, our service to the Lord, how that we bless others, is it not, does it not have at its core the shed blood of Christ? Meaning that if it wasn't for the shed blood of Christ, we wouldn't have anything. Right. We wouldn't be anything. We wouldn't be doing anything. Mm -hmm. He goes on and says, in the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Then he says, for we being many are one bread and one body. That's us. And he says, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So once again, as, as he says there at the beginning, the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. Everything that we are, everything that we cherish, everything that we can surmise is the body of Christ. Is all because of the blood of Christ. And it's all because of him. And so then in the end, as we, as we close, we would say that ultimately the opportunities that we have to serve then all come because of Christ. If he hadn't come and he hadn't shed his blood on the cross, if he hadn't died for our sins, as Paul said, we would be of all men most miserable. And that's exactly true. So here, regarding the reasons why one may go to church, may I suggest that as Christians it is not to be entertained, against which Paul warned, he warned about that time and time again. It is not even to see God or experience the other. And if you remember, I don't know if you remember that, back in the, we had talked about, um, we read about in the article, uh, why people go to experience God, or they some even call him the other. Um, but the idea is, is, is not even to see God or experience the other, for we are already his children if we know him as our Savior. But we assemble together as the church for the opportunity to serve. To serve God through our acts of devotion, and then also to serve him as children through the same means. And we would say that, so each opportunity that we have to be able to serve him, whether it's here in God's house, or even away from here, to look at those opportunities as blessings, and to be encouraged in this. And so as we as we close, you know, and we think about it, and, and let me just read that just briefly. Um, uh, for those of you that weren't here, or maybe forgot, um, the whole premise was, as I came across the article, and it was from a 2004 article. Um, it says, a uh, news article suggests many young people are interested in the latter as far as, um, or the quite, main point, I'm sorry, let me back up. So the first question was, is some seek to be entertained, others seek to encounter God? Mm -hmm. And so this article stated that uh, many young people are interested in the latter as far as just to actually encounter God. Um, I have been reading more articles lately, which to me is a blessing. I don't know that they're actually grabbing what we would say would be more fundamental fundamentalism, but uh, they're actually seeing that a lot of these new churches and these different things are not just they're not getting, they're, it's not doing it for them um, in their estimation. And I truly believe that individuals who are truly looking for God, you know, the light shows and everything else, it's not going to do it for you because it's not true worship. Um, and, and I believe that true worship is actually looking to God himself to do the work. 
And it's not going to be through emotionalism. It's not going to be through um, some, you know, all these different means that people are looking to today. Um, it's going to be God that does that work in our hearts. So, and it goes on to say in, in, in the uh, study, it's not that they don't care. In a study, 80% of people in their 20s said their faith is very important in their lives. But then we started talking about the trickle down from that number where it says, uh, they say that 80% of uh, their people are, are saying that, that God's important. And, and then it goes on and says, nearly 60% claim to have made a commitment to Jesus Christ. So remember these numbers, 80% said that God was important. 60% said that they had committed their life to Christ. Three-fourths told the Barna group uh, that they had prayed during the past seven days. So three-fourths said that. But in a typical week, just three out of ten of them attended church. So are you following the numbers still? Uh, only 30% of adults in their 20s um, attended a, a church this past year. Uh, the same percentage holds for those who have read the Bible during any given week. So only 30%. How many read the Bible? A 30%. So, so here you've got, the initial study said in a study, 80% of people in their 20s said that their faith is very important. But then only 30% are reading their Bibles. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a travesty. Mm -hmm. how, how is faith going to become, and we, let's just do away with the word faith, God. How is God going to become real and genuine in their lives um, if, if they're not in his word? Mm -hmm. So you see the problem. It goes on and says, uh, one of the trends, this uh, Charlie Grenade says, He's a singles pastor at Dayspring Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. Says one of the trends we're noticing is people are looking for something that's real. Mm -hmm. uh, college students are looking for a worship service where there's nothing fancy. Grenat said, adding that his church offers such an experience. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. My children that come, they they want to come all the time, and I'm begging the families that are having a hard time to pray for their children. The one who Also goes to show you the importance of, of families being able to instill what's important into the lives of our children, right? Mm -hmm. And then he ends up it ends up by saying uh, this one individual, Sally uh, Morgenthaler, addressed such desires in her book Worship Evangelism. Um, and then anyway, I, she she ends up saying inviting other unbelievers into the presence of God. Young people want to encounter the what they call the other at church, but they are not finding it there, she said. They're finding programs, they're finding games, mm -hmm. they're finding cute things to do, but they're not finding an experience with the other they assume is there somewhere in the world. That that's that's a travesty. <laughs> you know, and you wonder why people are leaving churches by the droves. It's because they're not finding God there. And if, if, we're, if we can't find God in church, if we can't experience him here, if we can't come here and truly worship him, then where else are, there, are people going to go? And I think for far too long, I, and I tell you, over, when I was over at Faith, um, I, I would tell, that was my, my pet peeve, was whenever people would come and, you know, and we had a wano, we had all kinds of different things, and, and um, um, uh, for the young people, we had activities and, and different things, and um, and I would, and then people would still come and say, "Well, you know, there's not enough here for my children." 
Mm. You know, what, what are you looking for? Um, the, the thought of it is, is that uh, a lot of times it, it, people come with the wrong mentality to church. They come with the attitude of self-seeking and self uh, it's really selfishness is what it boils down to. We come down to the aspect of, you know, what can the church do for me instead of what can I do for the church? No church has ever grown that way. Think about the early church. If the early church had had that mentality, they would have died in the first century. Um, but they understood that it was, it was sacrifice. It was sacrifice on, uh, on each one of our parts. And uh, you know, and uh, anyway, I know it's probably getting into ranting, but but the thought of it is, is that it's 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 for far too long, especially work, having worked in youth ministry for so long. Um, I think that we, as as churches, and I love fundamental churches in there along with everyone else, um, we've we've also secluded at times, and I I'm not. Anyway, I'm not trying to rock the boat here, but I think too one of the great and I've read different articles that have kind of proved that point, um, where they believe the the authors of those articles believe that where the church has really dropped the ball is in secluding um, young people from the service from the main service um, with the adults, and and they. And in those, and um, that was on the tail end of being over at Faith. And at times I'm like, because you know, because you have, you know, we have our and even here, we have our junior churches, and there's nothing wrong with those things. And um, I'm sure crying babies and everything else, and people probably appreciate being able to listen to the sermon. Um, but all those different things are needful. We understand. But there's probably something to be said. You know, just a couple hundred years ago, it's whenever Sunday school actually began. Um, nothing wrong with it. It all started with this, with with a, with a, a biblical approach, a biblical reason to it, and everything else. I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong. But I think sometimes, in even in things that we do, it also started taking the children out of out of the services, the main services, and then and then uh, actually the one article that I read uh, state it was it was it, it was um, giving credence to the fact of why young people. Were actually leaving the church whenever they graduated from high school, and the number one reason it was through the Barna Group, and they just polled them and would just ask them, you know, for individuals who were leaving, uh, not coming back to church, what was the reason? And they felt in their hearts that uh, once they graduated, that basically they graduated from church, because whenever they went to go start to you know, and grafted in. Then with the adults, um, the adults that either accept them, still just looked at them as little kids, mm -hmm. and then, or, uh, or so they were either not accepted, or they were told for far too long that they were just the children, and they just didn't see the need. Right. And these were, and these weren't just, you know, some fringe groups. These were fundamental churches too. So anyway, so anyway, probably a little bit of cave with all that. But on the flip side, it's things for us to think about, you know, because we and, and in this and it really delves into this whole situation as far as with our service to God, because how how what are we doing not only in our own lives, which we have to give an account for, but also as far as in the lives of future generations.
and this goes for it. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's, that's things to think, think about, about, isn't it? Some of you probably grew, grew up in Southern Baptist. We attended a uh, Southern Baptist church for a while when we moved back to Tennessee. Um, and uh, they, they had, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. It was a, um, yeah, it was, it was like a, it was a, it was, it was before, it was before the service. They would have, they would meet like early and then they would have, Training meeting, that's it. Training meeting, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, training meeting, that's what it was. And um, but anyway, they would have training meeting and they would have different classes and whatnot. And, and uh, anyway, um, but they would, they would, uh, I would say that that was probably as far as being in a church where they would have, um, they would have the training meeting, but that was before the service. They would meet at, at like five o'clock or something of that, that, that nature. And then we'd have the girls' class and then the guy, the boys' class, and and they would um, they went through the curriculum and everything. Um, then they would have the main service, but in the main service it was all combined. And uh, we did um, anyway. I'm not saying go Southern Baptist. <laughs> That's not my point. But uh, but anyway, but there's some things I think that we can actually learn from um, as a church. You know, I think that um, if we don't. Um, Evolve in some regards. Um, uh, I don't think we can be so fundamental, independent that we don't think through some things that are going to be able to help us um, to affect change, real change in the hearts of believers going forward. And that's for all ages. I think we need to be keep those things in mind. So, anyway, just some things to think about. But the the main crux of the whole matter is this evening is should we be seeking or serving and and again, just recapping it, uh, the, the seeking is good, but I think there's a lot of believers that, you know, that we can, where we can just seek and seek and soak, mm -hmm. and we're not doing anything with what we're doing, what, with what God's given to us. And that's the whole point here this evening, is to be able to serve, to serve God is far better, because that's what he's called us and, and <laughs> saved us to do. It's what he created us to do. Uh, for us to be able to come to know him as, as Savior, that's a blessing. And we need to relish in that daily. But if that's all we're doing is just giving him praise for what he's done, and we're not doing anything with it, then really what, what, what was the point? So we need to be serving him with the days he gives to us, don't we? Well, let's close in a word of prayer. And uh, appreciate your patience tonight and hearing everything out. Father, thank you so much just for the opportunity that we have to be able to look into your word tonight, to be able to these truths and, and I pray dear Father that you would just be with each one of us going forward dear Father in our, in our lives not only individually but also collectively as our church that you uh, truly give us wisdom dear Father help us to look to you uh, help us dear Father to uh, be said of us that we're truly a serving church not just a seeking church but a serving church dear Father and I pray that that would be said of us and I pray dear Father ultimately that one day that it would be said of us, well done, that good and faithful servants, each one of us, your Father, when we stand before you, that there wouldn't be anything that would uh, that we would be negligent about, and, and that we would be able to stand before you, not with our heads lowered because we weren't uh, living our lives for you, but your Father, that there might be a blessing whenever you call us your son and your daughter, and I'm thankful for that. And we look forward, dear, dear Father, to the day when we see you, and until that day comes, help us to be faithful to you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name.